administrators, security staff, and technicians, and a workforce of 3,000. The group's fleet of helicopters, corporate jets, and the speech craft were diverted to fly sorties between Mumbai, Jamnagar, and Burj, round the clock. They carried men, equipment, and hope.
determination is something that the people of Kach have in abundance. The first step of rehabilitation has come from the village. Kach is now coming back to normal. Shops are slowly opening for business. The first art and craft of Kach will soon flourish again. This is not the first disaster Kach has faced. Unfortunately, it will not be the last. Sri Lanka and uh, I'm, I'm a PhD candidate in University of Colombo and I'm a senior lecturer at uh, NSBM. Uh, my supervisor is uh, Dr. Raj Prasant who is not currently here so I'm presenting on behalf of both of us. So my topic is government initiatives to form knowledge networks to promote disaster resilience in Sri Lanka. This is actually just a part of my PhD research where I just wanted to recognize uh, how, what are the initiatives which the country and, right, so this is where I'm going to talk about the background of the research. Like before year 2004, uh, disaster management word was not very much used in the country because uh, there was a wide uh, disaster happened in 2004. Before that, uh, people were like only felt the uh, disasters when there was a flood comes and very minor earthquakes here and there, but uh, tsunami like really clicked the situation where okay, there is a need for going for disaster management in, as a country. So uh, the government's taken like lots of initiatives and they have uh, they, they, uh, came up with the ministry called this, uh, disaster ministry of disaster uh, management and under that they established uh, another specific institute called disaster management center uh, like and uh, there were lots of legis uh, legislative things happen like Sri Lanka disaster management act uh, in 2005 so after that uh, the Sri Lanka started <coughs> to moving towards uh, disaster management framework uh, so the currently we could say Shri, uh, the, the uh, this DMC disaster management center in Sri Lanka hereafter I call it DMC, and it's it's kind of developing very coordinated approach and public and private sector organizations mainstreaming DR in Sri Lanka, and uh, so they they are taking lots of initiatives. So I just wanted to look, like find out how these initiatives are looked at. But when I looking at first, I found that there are lots of empirical gap or literature attempting to evaluate uh, evaluate such development as a country, as well as like Asian context, lots of uh, problems are there. So before I move ahead, two terms are there I would like to uh, define. The, the first uh, term I would like to define is the word resilience. So here I would like to uh, define resilience as the capacity of a system to adapt to uh, adversity of a disaster and bounce back forward, strengthening community bounds and resources. Maybe I again highlight the word, I'm saying bouncing forward, not bouncing back. 
because most of the people say think that uh, after a disaster occurs, we should go back to previous state that where you were. But actual situation is most of the countries who came out of that and they have moved forward from there. So it's like a disaster is a learning lesson. Picking from there, you move ahead. So that is what the disaster resilience for me in my definition. The next term I would like to define is the knowledge networks. So maybe you might be thinking, what is this word knowledge network? So actually this knowledge network idea comes from the knowledge transfer, knowledge management beauty, as well as this is coming from social network theory. So combining together, I'm not going to talk about theoretical aspects here, but simply here knowledge networks means simply people and their relationships and they are assembled together to accumulate knowledge primarily means by knowledge creation transfer for, for the purpose of creating value. So I am looking at how disaster, at a disaster situation and prior to that, how knowledge networks are created to build resilience in the country. So that's the um, aim. And so the objectives of the research is mainly devoted to recognize government initiatives to form knowledge networks to promote resilience in Sri Lanka. So in this research, I looked at the current capacity of the multiple stakeholders to develop <coughs> networks within the country and how this has happened within different network <coughs> levels. So it's not just like one level, like, you know, it could be a community level, it could be uh, local authorities, it could be provincial level, or it could be higher governmental level. Okay, so uh, quickly I'll go through the research methods. I'm not going to talk about this much. So uh, the research methods mainly I am, uh, I, I took a very qualitative, interpretive, uh, like very inductive research approach. And this is a single case study design, and this is based on uh, grounded theory data analysis, just ground-run theory used only for the data analysis. So uh, here mainly I made use of purposive sampling strategies. So under that I have chosen politically important case sampling, which uh, permits the process of selecting and searching for a politically sensitive situation. So that's why based on for this I have selected DMC and they are published documents and, and I analyze them in detail to recognize what are the initiatives that have been done. Okay, so uh, this is the case of interest. That's the uh, uh, political importance of uh, Ministry of Disaster Management and DMC. I chose them purposely for purposefully for the uh, case study. And uh, the data care connection methods are mainly it's secondary data through document analysis. I looked at all the disaster management policies, SOPs, and different kinds of acts which are uh, developed to the country and uh, how that is being done. So um, these are the six documents uh, which are very lengthy documents and uh, it took a long time for me to go through each and everything. This includes different roadmaps that Sri Lankan government has uh, published, roadmap in 2005 and again updated version of that in 2006 and there are several uh, reports that are published by the Ministry of Disaster Management uh, including uh, flood disaster re uh, management and uh, lastly, it's about in 2014, which is the, le le uh, the latest document that I could found, that Sri Lanka Comprehensive Disaster Management Program published by MO, uh, Minister of Disaster Management in 2014. So I looked at all these six documents and I made you uh, them for my documentation. So uh, very quickly I'll go through uh, how I uh, gather the data because that is important. Uh, so I made use of, if anyone is uh, want to know about what are the methods I used, I used the Glacian Standard Constant Care Comparison, which is a grounded theory method of data analysis. And uh, I used constant comparison. It means it's a simply a process of constantly comparing instances that are the, the data labels with each other. Uh, so the, the constant comparison method which I followed had mainly three uh, stages. So the three stages are open coding, and then selective coding and theoretical coding. So through these three codes methods, I'm quickly moving through. This is uh, how I selected. So these are the documents through the open coding. The initially I, I found out there are 
uh, so I, I try to uh, recognize what are the codes that uh, they have used in their terminologies. So I, I, I found out about six, uh, 62 uh, categories, but when I try to compare this through selective coding, that means judgmentally I'm trying to categorize them, while that I mainly recognize two categories which the government initiatives are built on. One is the vulnerabilities, what are the vulnerabilities associated, and the second are what are the knowledge networks that they are trying to build. So with that I came now. When I talk about the government networks, uh, I, I could say Sri Lankan government has looked at a very uh, comprehensive institutionalized um, method for like you know integrating all the government institutions as well as private sector local and uh, public sector all the people together and they have done but there's a problem still none of these are only in the uh, you know documentation <coughs> so it still it's not very clear how far these things are practically implemented once it come to a real disaster situation so that's the uh, that, that's what where we have to see because we can't wait till another tsunami comes to test it out. It has to be uh, cleared out bef uh, before that. So, um, so these are the two categories that I looked at. So, first is uh, they have uh, the government uh, initiative. They have looked at knowledge networks. First, they have tried to recognize what are the key knowledge actors for the resilience. They have done that. So you can see uh, starting from uh, MODM to DMC and then uh, different government line ministries, departments, provincial and district secretariat officers, special expertise teams and uh, DM coordinators and Gram Seva Niladari, that's village <coughs> level leaders and military and search rescue team, volunteers, volunteer organizations. They have recognized these as actors in their government uh, documents. And uh, the second is, uh, they have also recognized different knowledge links. Links means like what are the formal linkages they have created. Like a gla it was very glad to see that, the, uh, though it is, uh, I'm not very sure how far it is implementing right or not, but they have recognized these links has to be created. So for example, they have established roles and identified DRN groups, NGOs, DM plans at the Gramaladari divisions, <laughs> local authorities, and also they have looked at coordinating units with uh, different uh, community-based DRN teams, uh, and then international and UN agencies, and, uh, and also there's another knowledge link, very nice knowledge link that they have recognized. Now if you ask people to just to come for knowledge sharing session and can we just have something like that, people never used to come. So in Sri Lanka there is a, uh, like we call them as ration programs, this Samurdhi uh, program where uh, they are distributing like you know some uh, funds for people, like for poverty, uh, related to poverty. And uh, this, uh, the DMC has taken initiative, they go, they send their expertise team to those. So then definitely people have to come there to get the uh, cash, so because of that people come. So uh, due to that, uh, the, through the ration programs, they have tried to build lots of networks inside. So there are lots of uh, different types of uh, links that they have recognized. So just summing it up, so this is the institutional framework currently which they have proposed. So they have uh, like all the ministries and the other side, uh, the other like police, finance, land, port supplies, all these uh, uh, will be directly reporting to the disaster management center. And uh, the next level is, this is how the net knowledge links have been created currently in the country. So these are all different types of ministries and they all are the connected to disaster management center through disaster management that uh, there are provincial councils through provincial councils they try to look at local authorities district secretaries and under that divisional secretaries gram niladaris and then villagers line departments and then uh, ngos and community based organizations so this entire uh, structure they have developed mandated and they are expecting that this will work, right? So this is the current uh, situation that the country is at. And, uh, but when I look at these, few networks they have like missed out. This is like what I looked at. 
Now, most of these networks that are looked at are transferring knowledge from top to bottom. Like that means knowledge, knowledge is going from uh, the DMC to uh, community. But I could not note much of happening in the reverse. So actually, it's another situation where lots of the things are, the, the knowledge is at the community, knowledge is, is at the people. And that has not been brought up to the disaster management level. So what I feel is this both has to happen in equal. And also I looked at, they have tried to uh, incorporate uh, government officials, um, like, you know, uh, of, try to uh, take uh, this community-based people, <laughs> communities to come and participate, and they try to build on participatory level of uh, disaster management. They have tried to uh, enroll, uh, incorporate people in when they're uh, forming these uh, disaster management maps, hazard maps, and they try to get the local people. They have done that, but I could not see evidence of they're taking children uh, into that. So school levels, they have just simply taken, uh, not taken into the consideration. So what I feel, this part is yet to be seen in the country. Okay, and then uh, quickly I'll go through uh, the, my code category two. These are the main vulnerabilities that are documented in the country. Documented, right? That's what I'm saying. There should be much more than this, but I'm looking at only what only the documental evidences. These are they, the government itself have recognized these as vulnerabilities. So one of that is the interinstitutional issue. Now I showed you a map of like in indicating all these things. In that framework, they call it as interinstitutional framework, and they are itself they are recognizing several uh, issues. One is some like like uh, institution uh, within the institution they don't have mandate. Like government has for the entire overall there is a mandate, but not for individual uh, institutes. And also there are like the several knowledge gaps in some stakeholders role in the, the disaster management. Like what is the, uh, what like when, when there is one particular person, what is his role? He has to have a very clear idea. And that was not very well identified. And also insufficient coordination between different levels of government or the authority. So like there's no very, uh, we could not see much harmony in that case. And also, this is another situation, some DM activities were duplicated. Like more than two to three um, you know, um, departments are doing the same thing. At the same time, there are situations where some DM responsibilities are not at all uh, you know, looked at. So that's another aspect. And uh, lastly, but not, this is very important, and uh, we could not see legal background for this. Uh, it's over there, but for different institutions, they don't have any legitimate backing towards incorporating between this organization. So this is uh, uh, the main uh, issues that I look uh, found under inter-institutional inter issues. And then, um, like I think most of us, like in India and all the other countries that I discussed so far, they have recognized many uh, resource problems and infrastructural problems. So similarly. There's a big uh, problem of trained human resources and mitigatory rescue operation officers. There was a lack. And also, uh, DM training was inconsistent. That was another issue. Inconsistent, like uh, uh, the way that they're training one set of people was different to the, the way that the others are tra uh, trained. So that was another problem. And also, uh, uh, favorable attitudes were missing and also like resource limitations for the definite like there are lots of resource limitations once it comes to the local administration level and uh, so these are all different types of uh, you know uh, lack of resources uh, that that's there and uh, so the lastly procedural and legislative ambiguities that I looked at Mainly there is a gap of absence of consistent process for gathering information for risk assessment. Risk assessment process is at a very, very uh, lower state and uh, like, the, the, like now it transfer was not uh, applicable once it comes to especially public book because uh, most of the people don't have enough finances to uh, you know, uh, take insurance for themselves. And, uh, and uh, like, but then again, uh, so 
this kind of procedural issues were still uh, looked at. And uh, so summarizing the whole thing, like, uh, so this is again coming from the grounded theory. I looked at the framework, so this is the context of the country and the current condition and what are the courses and what are the covariances and then uh, the, uh, the, con con uh, the contingents will be established knowledge based institutional community network. Because what I believe is power is with people and uh, so different scenarios. Uh, some very useful you know, information and experience and studies that okay. most for this governance gets improved. So I think it's a very important point. Assessments are the key, the foundation of any you know, yeah, without plan. a measure, you yeah. can't really see whether you have done something or not. Right? Okay. So, there so, are no validation, definitely. Yeah, validation has to be. Done. So, if assessment are strong, then the performance indicator. First, it ensures the yeah. legal structure, then yeah. validate that. Correct. Both Correct. things are missing. Correct. Okay, so that's one, one section because I can represent that view. If like I can say in my industry, okay. when earthquake of 6.9 occurred in the Gujarat, good. Our industry made out eight tractor scale. Mm -hmm. Our eight tractor scale, they know so the land industry is down there. Okay. okay. Yeah, what you are saying is about when communities get the opportunity to do it, then of course mock drills, etc., are things that everyone does. But if you want to translate the concept of risk transfer, risk financing, and all the risk Correct. These are activities. There is certain These are activities. These do, and uh, it goes to the approach which you are saying. Unless it gets decentralized to the last mile, okay, these things are they remain somewhere else. Okay. So, but then in places yes, the like Delhi, people should be there. Pardon? People to command. That is okay. Even in complex, uh -huh. there should be the number one, number two. If some mm -hmm. apartment complex is there, okay. there should be a uh, first person to take charge of the situation mm -hmm. if something happens. Mm -hmm. So that uh, responsibility should be given to the first person. Mm -hmm. The person is not there, the mm -hmm. second person. So alternatives and then they should yeah. be taking the responsibility how to act and how to react. Yeah. It should be like a command uh, person. So Correct. he should be uh, giving, delegating the things what he has, uh, other people are doing. Mm -hmm. Afflicted communities, what we call. There is one where the authority, be it a local authority, disaster management authority, simulate drills in cities, in town, mostly in cities, and these drills are mostly earthquake drills. No other disaster is, you know, given a drill. Cyclone drills don't exist, flood drills don't exist. But where civil society does it, then they follow a different pattern, NGO and now the tsunami things are coming to place. Yes, so that is in choice system, tsunami. which is an alert, warning, etc. Those, I think India, at least this region has some, you know, good state-of-the-art technologies. And or just to say, if we fix up the responsibility accountability properly, mm -hmm. that things can be in a better picture. Okay. So does that answer the question that we can do risk transfer? Yeah, is that happening? Is from the risk transfer, yeah. risk financing is something. Okay. Yeah. So now most of the countries, like you look at, uh, when there is a disaster happen, NGOs and you know other countries and they get together and just give some lump sum to the people. Mm. But uh, there is not actually like there's nothing called insurance. Mm. Like for example, all foreign countries, like Western countries, they have mm. insurances. Mm -hmm. So they know how to build them back. Mm -hmm. But uh, unfortunately, most of the Asian countries, they don't mm -hmm. have insurance schemes mm -hmm. apart from that with their, like, you know, their vehicles and houses and especially small businesses, they don't have insurance no, no. at all. In fact, they are excluding the natural calamity yes. from the insurance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Top of that, to insure the vehicular houses, mm -hmm. they put a clause not covered with the natural mm -hmm. calamity. So what, what do you want to say on that? Should this Congress say something about that? At least the design stage, mm. like buildings or big structures or anything, mm. all the design for earthquake resilient structures, so that should be taken into consideration so that the, the damage is present, okay. at least in the design stage itself. Okay. 